Thank you, Pika, and good morning. Um, I am John Stride, Secretary of the Board of Governors for the City Club. It is City Club's pleasure to welcome you to this morning's State of the County program featuring Noma County Chair Jessica Vega Peterson. For more than 100 years, Portland City Club has hosted public forums, debates, and research to help Portlanders make informed decisions around elections and public policy. City Club is committed to providing space for people to gather and engage in civil, civic dialogue. Members make the City Club run by providing ideas, leading conversations, doing research, and creating our community. To volunteer for a program committee or research study or an issues committee, please become a member of City Club today. You can visit pdxcityclub.org slash membership and let us know how you'd like to engage with the City Club of Portland and our community. We welcome you to our public square and thank you for your support now and in the future. Please mark your calendars for three more City Club's programs coming to you soon. The first is the State of the Region with Metro President Lynn Peterson, no relation to Jessica. Uh, and it's on Wednesday, May 22nd at noon at the Newmark Theater. Next will be reflections by retiring Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum on Wednesday, June 5th at 5 p.m. at the First Congregational Church in downtown Portland. And two days later, on June 7th, we'll welcome Oregon Director of Education, Charlene Williams, to our stage for our State of the Education program. Join us for that program at 5.30 p.m. at the PCC Cascade Moriarty Auditorium. You can register for all three of these upcoming programs at the City Club website, pdxcityclub.org. And while you're there, take an opportunity to join the City Club. Now to this morning's forum. First, out of respect for all of our audience members, would you please take a moment to silence your phones? Thank you. We will begin our program with a short video produced by the county, and then Chair Peterson will deliver her state of the county remarks, followed by a more in-depth conversation with our moderator, Cynthia Gomez. If you have a question for Chair Peterson, please write it on an index card you received at the start of the program and hold it high for a City Club greeter to collect. Our moderator will ask two to three questions from the audience. Cynthia Gomez is Director of Community and Civic Impact at Portland State University. She holds a Master's of Fine Arts, a Master's of Education, and a Certificate of Chicano Latino Studies. Cynthia is a Certified Foresight Essentials Practitioner with the Institute for the Future. She serves on the Board of Directors of the Latino Network and the American Leadership Forum, Oregon. It is now my great honor to introduce Jessica Vega Peterson, the first elected Latina Chair of Multnomah County Commission. Prior to this role, Jessica served as a Multnomah County Commissioner and led a historic effort to expand early childhood education and championed the successful campaign to provide universal preschool in all Multnomah County, for all Multnomah County three and four year olds. Previously, she was elected as the first Latina to serve in the Oregon House of Representatives. In the legislature, Vega Peterson fought for issues such as paid sick leave, pay equity, raising the minimum wage to improve the lives of women and working families in Oregon, and clean, sustainable, climate initiatives. Multnomah County encompasses the largest population in Oregon's 36 counties, yet is the smallest in Oregon counties in terms of geographic territory. Over 800,000 people call Multnomah County home. Chair Vega Peterson oversees a budget of nearly $4 billion and more than 5,500 county employees who provide safety net services for seniors, those who are homeless and disabled people, 
animal services, assessment and taxation, community justice, courts, elections, bridges, health services, jails, libraries, marriage licenses, and passports. And in addition, school and community partnership is a big job. The county also oversees the budget for the Multnomah County Sheriff, the district attorney, and auditor, all of whom are independently elected leaders. Vega Peterson serves on a board with four elected county commissioners and each of them, each of these positions is up for election in the May primary. In fact, I'll remind you that the deadline to register to vote is tomorrow, April 30th. Ballots will be mailed the next day. And this primary election is Tuesday, May 21st. We, of course, encourage you all to vote. Before we bring up Chair Vega Peterson, I would like to ask you to turn your attention to the screen for a short video. It's been a big year for Multnomah County. We've worked hard to repair our social safety net, spent time in community, and focused on the essential services that help people live with more safety, trust, and belonging. We're committed to continuous process improvement and centering the community and those with lived experience in everything we do. I know that we all want to live in a community where people have a safe place to call home. Safety, shelter, support, and stability help people pushed into homelessness rebuild their lives. We're solving our homelessness crisis with a homelessness response system that includes more safe and efficient shelters, data, connections, and outreach and invest in rent assistance and providing the services that help people stabilize and rebuild. We're just finishing a tri-government 90-day fentanyl emergency to address complex issues and bring people together to pilot street responses that make our streets safer. This will give us a roadmap for this work across Multnomah County and help us meet people where they are with the connections they need. Voters passed an initiative to update and expand the county library system. This year, we've broken ground on five new or updated facilities, including an incredible state-of-the-art library operations center to help us serve book lovers for generations to come. We fought back against big oil to make sure Multnomah County has what it needs during our next emergency. Suing the fossil fuel industry for a weather event climate scientists have concluded was the result of climate change brought on by the burning of fossil fuels. There's a one in three chance this region will experience a magnitude 8.0 earthquake in the next 50 years. We need to be prepared. Replacing the Burnside Bridge with a new, seismically resilient one will bring a much needed modern connection to serve our region for the next 100 years. We all want animals to be treated humanely and compassionately. Multnomah County Animal Services is here to reunite pets with families, care for injured animals, and find stable homes. When kids get a quality preschool education, they're more likely to graduate high school, attend college, and succeed in their careers. Preschool for All is a meaningful investment in the future of kids and our county. Every program serving youth shares our commitment to seeing, valuing, and empowering the next generations. We must continue initiatives that foster holistic community safety and connect the least connected parts of our county paving the way for a future that's safer and healthier, no matter which zip code you call home. We're working to increase access to the beautiful spaces we love and cherish. This includes strengthening stretches of our roadways, renaming some of our most cherished bridges, and planting new trees to honor lives lost. Our partnerships help us connect, collaborate, and work from a place of shared vision and values. Partnerships are the cornerstone of who we are and who we can become. We all deserve to feel supported, trusted, and valued, to live, rise, and thrive. Our success as a county depends on our ability to work together to make a safer and more just world possible.
thank you all for being here today. I had to, um, I'm on a step stool because I literally couldn't see the first row. So, <laughs> so if I'm taller, that's why. Um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, John and City Club for your support for our community and with this event. I know there's several City Club volunteers here who are helping make today this possible. So thank you so much for all you do. I also want to thank uh, Kiko, um, OMSI's Vice President of Learning Experience, as one of the newer members of their leadership team. Thank you for your partnership in hosting us here today and for your help with putting on this entire event. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great to have you in so many ways be partners for the county. So today is an exciting day and a big moment for our community. Today I get to talk with you about our shared vision for Multnomah County and all of the work that we will be doing in the next year to achieve that vision. We are here at OMSI today. It is a hopeful, visionary, engaging place. It is a place that celebrates science, innovation, and the impactful things that people and systems can achieve when we work together. That exactly captures the spirit of the State of the County Address. I appreciate all of you coming here to be here with us together this morning. Our access our success as a county and as a community depend on each of us, and especially those of us who choose to step into leadership roles. I want to recognize and appreciate the many leaders who are here today. I want to appreciate DA Schmidt, Sheriff um, Nicole Morrissey O'Donnell. We have Chair Harrington here. Um, we have Representative Mark Gamba. I know there are many, many other people who are here. I don't have a list for, of everybody, but I just appreciate everyone who's here. I especially appreciate all of our Multnomah County employees and department directors who are in attendance. And I wanna acknowledge the board of Multnomah County Commissioners, Commissioner Sharon Myron, Commissioner Jesse Beeson, Commissioner Julia Brim Edwards, and Commissioner Lori Stegman. Thank you so much for all you do for our county and being here this morning. And I forgot to mention Auditor McGurk, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned the auditor as well. I appreciate her partnership in everything we do. Um, I want to say thank you to Cynthia Gomez, who we'll be hearing from more later. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this morning as our moderator. So this is my second chance to address you as the chair of Multnomah County and deliver a state of the county address to bring you closer to my vision for how our community moves forward in the coming year and beyond. I'm here today to talk about three things, our community, our values, and how Multnomah County is moving forward to our, tackle our biggest problems. Our job is to help people on their hardest days and provide a safety net for those whom our greater systems fail. To decades of federal disinvestment in housing, we provide a growing network of shelters, transitional supports, and affordable housing. And every day, we're adding more. To a broken and unaffordable childcare system, we're providing free, quality, joyful preschool for more, more than 2,000 kids this year in Preschool for All, and every day we're adding more. To this historic lack of treatment and services for people who suffer with addiction, mental illness, and substance use, we've marshaled peer support and connections, treatment and stabilization options, and recovery housing and supportive housing services and every day we're adding more. For people entangled in the justice system, we provide intervention, restoration, and victim services. And every day we are adding more. For young parents, we provide the support to finish school and find work while supporting healthy pregnancies and breastfeeding once the baby arrives. And every day we're growing more. For indigenous people, we turn to the wisdom of elders so the community can address its challenges through traditional values and healings. And every day, we are listening more. For people in food deserts and transit deserts and service deserts, we're extending county resources to as many neighborhoods as we can so everyone has ac equal access to nutrition, transportation, and the ballot box. And every day, we're reaching more. To the readers among us, libraries. <laughs> And every day we're building more. This is our work as a community and the work I wake up to every day as your county CEO. One thing we know about this moment in history is that our big urban centers have been struggling. The pandemic has made the problems worse, but it was already hard, brought on by multiple crises decades in the making, a lack of federal investment in affordable housing, a drug called fentanyl that requires a new fix every few hours, 
the escalating cost of health care and child care, a shameful lack of sobering and treatment beds throughout our state, and new anxiety in, in new anxiety and instability in our lives and in our families. It is hard work, and our county is moving forward, making progress in our achievements and being accountable to the public every single day. We have new leaders across our community stepping up to find collaborative solutions and joining us in creating the clear plans needed to tackle homelessness, substance abuse, and community safety. I have never doubted for a second that together we can get there. People say that Multnomah County is the social safety net, and that is true. But my North Star has always been to create a society that doesn't require a safety net. That is what drives me. There are so many things to look forward to. But also, let me take a moment to be clear. Multnomah County is under a magnifying glass in a way that it's never been before. It is exactly because we sit at the crux of these critical social issues, but it's also because Multnomah County insists on pushing for solutions that address racial injustice, that we treat people sleeping outside with dignity and respect, that we consider the impacts of our decisions broadly, and pushing for those things can make people uncomfortable. We can't expect to create systemic change but by relying on unexpected one-off dollars, like the investments made by the federal government during the pandemic. We must be building the community we need in lean years too, and for the long term, not just today. How do we do this? We do this by leading with our values and insisting on meaningful, measurable change for the better, even when we have to make tough choices about our investments. We center work that changes the underlying systems that have created our unequal society, racial disparities, economic disparities, the present day realities of centuries of purpose and systemic discrimination. I know that this is possible. It is within our reach. We are successful when we take a human centered approach that includes people and partners with lived experience. We've seen this clearly during our 90 day fentanyl emergency and our work at the Behavioral Health Resource Center. We are successful when we collaborate, when we work in partnership with community for their investment and their involvement throughout all of our work, and especially in our largest initiatives like our Homelessness Response Action Plan. We are successful when we insist on clear specific goals, data-driven outcomes, and transparency and accountability in how we meet them. Right now, we are balancing urgent action clear results and, account and accountability with prudent stewardship of taxpayer dollars, of timelines, of processes that support equity, of the collaboration to build fast and smart in ways that are realistic, will go the distance and align with the values that center our work. I released my executive budget this past Thursday, and I hope as you'll can, you'll take a look not just at the proposed investments, but the ways that we're thinking about them, who they support and why. In a new way for the chair's office, I prioritized including your voices in this year's budget. We've already heard from over 1,000 community members who shared their priorities for our county. Not surprisingly, homelessness and behavioral health services rose to the top, including mental health and substance use support. Our community also highlighted the importance of the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office contributions to public safety, the positive impacts on preschool for all for youth and families, and the deep value of our library services. All of these investments are reflected in how I built this year's executive budget. In order to address the complex challenges of our times, we need to be an organization built to handle them. My budget will help us live our values in being a place where we have the infrastructure to help people live, rise, and thrive, no matter who you are, where you live, or what kind of support you need. In the next year, we must build on these last year's successes and continue to make meaningful strides to address homelessness, the fentanyl and drug crisis, new behavioral health resources, including sobering and deflection, and investments for community safety across the entire county. My budget includes full funding for our jails, adult parole and probation, and specialty courts. 
Across the board, we are moving quickly in urgency, bringing more and better resources to our streets and to our community. We have already started to set up a program that will deflect people away from our criminal justice system and into the services that they need when changes to our drug laws through House Bill 4002 are fully implemented on September 1st. This is a short and aggressive timeline, but we have prioritized this work to ensure that when law enforcement have the tools they need to keep our community safe, they also have the tools they need to directly connect someone to services for their addiction. Without clear action, too many people will be caught unnecessarily in our justice system. I have convened an executive team that includes leadership from the city, law enforcement, the courts, the district attorney's office, and the treatment community to make rapid decisions. I have hired a coordinator to fully focus on being ready for September 1st and beyond. I have mobilized staff from across impacted Multnomah County departments, and we will make this deadline. We must have people moving quickly from our streets and into housing. This includes urgency across all our work and with all our partners, and ensuring that the resources we have through the Supportive Houses Services measure get the outcomes I expect that we all expect. Making sure these generous taxpayer resources are moving through our systems to positively impact people's lives is a huge priority, and I'm happy to report that our joint office is on track. The work that's happened in the last year is incredible, and the joint office is capitalizing on their momentum. This fiscal year, they've already allocated $91 million. Spending is on track for the goals that we have for this year. In February, Mayor Ted Wheeler and I announced the Homelessness Response Action Plan this community has been asking for with clear goals. Mayor, thank you for being here today. In the next two years, we will house and shelter 2,700 more people. We will add an additional 1,000 shelter beds and hundreds of behavioral health beds. We will increase the number of adults leaving shelter for permanent housing by at least 15%. We will make sure that 75% of people placed in permanent supportive housing are still there 24 months after placement. And we will reduce homelessness among specific priority populations, including people of color and people identifying as LBGTQIA2S+. This Homelessness Response Action Plan brings together everyone to work from a shared roadmap. Healthcare providers, our justice system, housing providers, service providers, crisis responders, our government partners at all levels. This is collaboration in action. I know that meeting these goals will make life better for everyone in our community. Expanding our shelter system and supporting people to transition into permanent housing more quickly. In the next few weeks, we'll ink a new intergovernmental agreement with the city of Portland to finalize our governance model and move our homelessness response forward even more quickly. And we're working on the workforce challenges by investing in our providers, including $10 million in grant funds to 61 providers. These investments directly support the case managers, clinicians, peers, and other workers serving unhoused people every day and keeping this critical workforce safe. As the video said, today also marks the end of our 90-day fentanyl emergency, a time when we've made huge changes to how our governments work together, from policy to street-level response. We have brought new urgency, solutions, and lived experience into this emergency. This is partnership in action. I'm especially heartened to hear success stories like Vicki's, a woman living chronically in a tent on the side of I-5 until this fentanyl emergency began. Because of the connections made through the Behavioral Health Resource Center, Vicki finally was ready to receive the support and successfully moved into the Fentanyl Triangle. This temporary alternative shelter site has housed many people throughout this emergency. She now lives safely in a pod with her son and soon will be connected with more permanent housing. I know. We are proud, too, of the work to expand a successful pilot between the Portland, uh, Portland Police Bike Team and behavioral health providers like the Mental Health and Addictions Association of Oregon, Health Justice Recovery Alliance, Recovery Works Northwest, the Miracle Club, and Northwest Instituto Latino to increase our peer-based approach to behavioral health intervention.
this street level support is changing people's lives. People like Vicky, who are finally able to move towards health and stability. Like the rest of us, our community has long suffered without enough treatment options for mental health and substance use disorders. My budget combines investments from the state of Oregon, the city of Portland, and Multnomah County into a $29 million deflection, sobering, and recovery package that will help us make meaningful strides and launch a new 24 7 drop off, sobering, and deflection center. This is partnership in action. Homelessness response and supporting everyone's health and well being. This is the urgent work that I am rapidly moving forward at the county. But we also have to make upstream investments in the systems that say change our society in the long run. This year, we are issuing a new RFP for our successful Schools Uniting Neighborhoods program. This is an opportunity to design the program to meet the needs of our children and families while recognizing the needs of our schools and partners. And we are making huge investments in preschool for all. To reach our 2030 goal of, of universal preschool, we must continue building up our infrastructure and increase our workforce to make sure that there is an opportunity for every three and four year old in Multnomah County to experience a joyful quality preschool experience. We know when kids have access to early education, their lives are forever impacted. This year, I am convening a technical advisory group to study the impacts and needs and provide recommendations on how to best ensure the program remains successful on track for the long term. Through Preschool for All, we're giving child care centers, home-based child care, and school districts grants to improve and upgrade their buildings and infrastructure. Without these grants, many would not be able to afford it. 20% of Preschool for All providers who participated in the program last year were able to expand into new locations for their second year in the program. This money stabilizes preschool providers that may be financially on edge and gives them opportunities to grow. That is huge. I am happy to say that one of those providers is here with us today. Family Cares Daycare, run by incredible providers Anita and James. They work with a group of amazing staff to serve 96 Multnomah County three and four year olds in six locations across the county. Anita and James told us that with the stability provided by Preschool for All, they were able to double their capacity to serve kids over the past few years. They would not have been able to provide the care they can now, especially kids who are medically fragile or with special needs. Kids with special needs are so often left out of our preschool systems. Preschool for All changes that. Stable pay for James and Anita's staff have helped them hire enough educators to staff classrooms where children need more support. They say Preschool for All offers them thoughtful partnership and curriculum, stable enrollment, and helping set the highest standards for early childhood education. Anita and James have recently applied for facilities fund dollars to continue to build and expand. Says Anita, working closely with Preschool for All is the best thing we've ever done. Thank you, Anita and James, for all you do to support children and parents and for the incredible care that you take every day. I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. Thank you. None of this urgent, critical work that we have to do will be possible without Multnomah County being grounded, being centered, living its values, not just in the work we do, but in the way that we do it. Our employees do incredible work and they are always looking to improve our excellent services and being a leader in our region and our state. I want Multnomah County to continue to be an employer of choice and for our employees to feel supported in the work that they do. Last year, I committed to revitalizing our workforce equity strategic plan and this year we are moving into action. This plan gives us accountability, better tools for evaluation, and turns the suggestions we've heard and the goals that we've set into action to change the daily lives of our workforce and the people that we serve. While many other counties and states are running away from racial justice and diversity and equity work, I am doubling down. 
our county is addressing disparities in our services head on, and we are focused on ensuring every member of our community has a chance to live, rise, and thrive. This kind of work is hard work. It is uncomfortable. It is critical. And we are digging in at Multnomah County. We are investing in innovation and progress to, that includes new research and evaluation dollars in our Office of Diversity and Equity. I want to give a shout out to Director Joy Fowler and her amazing team in that office. We are in the final stages of a new mission, vision, and values for Multnomah County. The first time that we are investing in those baseline concepts in more than a decade. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Serena Cruz, our Chief Operating Officer. Serena is leading efforts to help us take a less siloed, more coordinated, and more strategic approach to every part of our work in the county. In my budget are investments to make sure our organization has the structure to do just that. This expansion will help us match the ways other governments are run, from the city of Portland to Washington County. When we're less siloed, we can do more with less. We can more easily partner across our departments, which help us, helps us to be more responsive. With better strategy comes better systems to support employees and our contracted partners. Ultimately, the more strategic we are, the more effective we will be. We are using the data we gather to inform what happens next. We are sharing information. We are collecting feedback. We are reporting back. We are moving forward with an improved dashboard in the Joint Office of Homeless Services, as well as an overhaul of the usability of our entire homelessness management information system. All of this helps us be accountable to voters, our community, and make significant pro progress. I am committed to providing you with progress updates on how our work is going, from House Bill 4002 implementation, to building out our homelessness, um, our behavioral health system, to our urgent, earnest, excuse me, our urgent homelessness response. All three of these things are just some of the critical priorities we are gonna be working on in the next year. This is what people expect, and it's absolutely what we can and will deliver on. Before I close, I wanna talk a little bit about partnership because developing and maintaining successful and th thoughtful partnerships is a focal point in how I lead. I believe policies and programs built in collaboration with key partners, governments, and those with lived experience are the strongest and best policies. They're more viable in the long run. This includes moving with urgency and intention when a partner comes to us with a new idea, like Central City Concern did last December. A building had become available and would allow us to quickly build new sheltering and stabilization capacity. And we worked closely to mobilize our partners, including the state and the city, and move this idea and move this from an idea to a purchased building in just a matter of days. This approach to partnership will make a difference in turning a corner as a community, as well as we make good on our promises to affect homelessness, mental and behavioral health, substance use, and community safety at their roots. To walk in, to walk in step, an ongoing discussion with the state, with Portland, with the East County cities, with Metro and our other regional and federal partners to pull together a response that capitalizes on best practices and maximum investment. This is exactly the philosophy that's at the root of our homelessness response system. It's an approach that capitalizes on the state investments for new treatment bed capacity that looks upon situations like the fiscal uh, troubles at Bybee Lakes Hope Center as an opportunity to preserve shelter beds and create a way forward that previously did not exist for the county. It's one that includes partnerships and collaboration with this board of county commissioners and a new group of commissioners joining us in January of next year. I want to take a moment and ask each one of my colleagues on the board to stand as I say a few words about what your work has meant to me and our county this year. From District 1, Commissioner Sharon Myron. Sharon, thank you for the acumen you bring around our behavioral health and substance use disorder issues. For convening system experts to think, to think big, including the recent convening of substance use providers, 
and for your personal commitment to practicing street level outreach and medical interventions that connect our policy work to best practices. From District 2, Commissioner, Commissioner Jesse Beeson. Thank you, Jesse, for you and your office's continued commitment to standing with asylum seekers and helping our region and our state develop a stronger, more equitable safety net. I am inspired by your work and the way you have stepped in to represent District 2 in such a short time. Thank you so much. From District 3, Commissioner Julia Brim Edwards. Julia, thank you for your proactive and thoughtful approach to developing the sobering center our county has long needed and that will be such a critical piece of our substance use disorder continuum of care. Although you have been on the board for less than a year, your impact is already being felt so strongly. Thank you so much for all your work. From District 4, Commissioner Lori Stegman. Lori, Thank you for your consistent advocacy for East County, especially around economic development and infrastructure. It has resulted in nearly $1 million in my budget for the City of Gresham's Homelessness Services team and to expand outreach and rental assistance. Yes, wait, where I'm not done. To expand outreach and rental assistance programs in Fairview, Wood Village, and Troutdale. I know in your time left on the board, you are working hard to move forward. Click Plaza and Vance Vision, and I look forward to working with you on those. I'm grateful to each of you for your leadership and your partnership, especially in these challenging times. This is work I know we can do when we do it together. I wanna end with a call to action to everyone in this room, everyone watching at home, everyone who might watch this later on. We cannot do this work alone. Your connection to and investment in our county as an employee, as someone receiving services, as a community partner or an engaged citizen, it all matters. It matters to me. And most importantly, I believe it matters to you. Knowing what your local government values, what we're prioritizing and the part you can play is critical to us moving forward to meet those challenges that we face. I applaud everyone who is using their voice now the problems that we're solving are not easy. Many of them have been decades in the making. Our community is anxious for change and isn't afraid to say so. As Commissioner Beeson shared so well in our board meeting this last week, we have an earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project that will take 14 years from start to finish. Many of the structural challenges we're solving for right now have been with us for decades. Why do we expect these systemic changes to take less time to change than it takes to build a bridge that will serve us for the next 100 years? The answer is we have to do both. We have to build the bridge and fix our system so that they can support people better. And we have to do this work with urgency because even though it may take time to make the changes to these structures, that work must happen today. As I said earlier, so much of our important work can't be done without Multnomah County building it from the ground up and doing that successfully. We're doing that with our Homelessness Response Action Plan. We're doing it with our Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. We are doing it with renewed partnerships. We are making great strides. Many people have used this quote because it's a good one. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. I need you and we need you to do this work together. I look forward to working with each of you in this next year. I know that our successes and our progress will happen because we do this together. So here's to the next year of working together. I wanna to thank you all for being here today and I chose the commitment that we have. This is a new day. It is a new time for our county, for our city, for our state, for our community. And I am so grateful to be doing with this work with all of you. Thank you. Okay, I'm a little bit too tall on the stool, so. I'm Sarah Guest, uh, Chair Vega-Peterson's Communications Advisor 
Uh, first, I want to give another shout out and thank you to OMSI and City Club for hosting us today. Now we'll look forward to a conversation with the Director of Community and Civic Impact at Portland State University, fellow opinionated Latina, Cynthia Gomez. <laughs> The chair has known Cynthia for years, and she's spearheading incredible work, including putting PSU on a path as an emerging Hispanic surveying institution. Currently, 18.5% of graduating students at PSU are Latine, a proud distinction and an important one for our region. We're also looking forward to ending the program with a couple of audience questions. So if you haven't handed yours to someone who is collecting them throughout the room, please consider taking out a pen and doing that right now. Cynthia, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Sarah. So first of all, Jessica, thank you so much for the invitation. It's not lost on me, the importance of this moment. Um, and it's an honor to be part of this event um, during a time of profound transformation for our region. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, so, But I wanna start first by um, looking back. In the last year, um, what are some of the most significant things that you have learned? What are the stories that stand out the most? Uh, can you all hear me? Oh, there we go. Um, so thank you, Cynthia, so much for being the moderator, first of all. I was really um, so glad to have you with me here this morning. So, you know, looking back at this year, I think the thing, there are a couple different things. One is that, um, the scope and the complexity of the issues that we have to face are are um, are just permeate every every corner of our community, every corner of our society. Where we're talking about the impact um, on our on our youth and on our children from that are still feeling impacts from the pandemic to the crisis of homelessness to um, you know concern for what's happening with our climate right there are so many issues across the board but what has really struck me and what I've really felt so much over this last year is just how willing people people are to step in to this really hard work people want to be part of the solution people want to be bringing forward their answers and for me as the Multnomah County chair it has been about having a um, having the type of relationships, having the accessibility to be able to bring people into that work. Even when people are saying things that they don't agree with about the county or things that they want to have change. For me, it's always been about uh, making sure that we are approaching our work with, um, with curiosity, with learning, and with our best intentions of serving the people that are most needed in our, in our society, in our community. And people understand that. And I, and I have always felt that whether you're working you know, across the aisle with someone in the legislature or whether you're working with somebody um, who has a different perspective, there's the path forward if you're, if you're grounded in the values that you do. So, um, you know, so I think that uh, for me, like really understanding that the, um, the incredible work that we have together um, is, is hard work, but it's work that, that people are anxious for. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to jump in with a question about preschool for all. Okay. Um, I am hearing from a lot of parents of young children that are concerned that there might not be adequate funding to continue the program at the expected rate. Um, I've also heard people um, ask questions around where is... Uh, what's the future of preschool for all? They're concerned that it's not going to be here for them when they need it. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I will say that the um, preschool for all has been um, wildly successful in some of the major goals that we've had in growing the number of seats and growing the opportunities um, for more children, children who traditionally didn't have access 
to a quality preschool experience, um, being able to have those doors open for them. We've also been able to invest in and stabilize our early education workforce, which was one of the biggest obstacles. And just this year, we opened um, our facilities fund to allow um, investments in infrastructure and expansion. That is also one of the biggest um, challenges for um, for um, preschool and childcare, you know, in our in our region and in our country. I will say that um, we have actually had more funding than expected through Preschool for All. So from a financial perspective, we have resources that we need and then some in order to make um, good on the commitments we have to grow um, the program in the way that it needs to. We will need to um, continue to look at the investments that we have. Um, there we go. Uh, to look at the investments, um, how we're going to be using those investments in the year and what and um, and that's one of the reasons why I brought together the technical advisory committee um, that will be forming to really take a look at what what do we need for those investments and how do we make sure that we have what we need to fulfill the um, the universal goal of the program by 2030. That is a commitment that I hold strongly, um, and it's one um, that I think the the community can count on. So I work at Portland State, mm -hmm. as you all know, and um, our students are very anxious to step into these roles and they and we understand at portland state there's a critical staff shortage mm -hmm. you know there you know we can build all the programs we want but if we don't have the people to step into those leadership roles to be able to make sure that those programs um can be uh deployed and operationalized then we're just kind of in a really difficult place have you found that to be a challenge at the county how are you addressing that yeah i mean Workforce issues, I don't care if we're talking about homelessness. I don't care if we're talking about uh, behavioral health support. I don't care if we're talking about preschool. I don't care if we're talking about, um, you know, I, you know, like finding somebody to to fill some of the like, you know, critical roles in the county across the board. Workforce is a challenge um, for us at the county. I know it's a challenge um, for so many people in our community right now. And, you know, I have to say, I think that the workforce challenges we're facing are a part of the disinvestments that we have had in valuing the, the critical work that people do at every single level. I think that is true when we talk when we were talking about an outreach worker who is going out and and connecting with people who are living outside and trying to, you know, um, bring them in and um, get them more resources. I think it's true when we're talking about um, the nurses that are staffing our county jails. I think it is true when we're talking about you know, the, the child care um, teacher who is doing that. So for me, continuing to make sure that we are investing in our workforce in different ways um, is, is has to be a part of the long term solution, not just at the county, but but in um, so many other places in our society for preschool for all. One of the things that it was built with the program was to actually include a living wage, not just for the classroom educators, but also for the classroom assistants that are doing there. Um, in Multnomah County, in this budget for the second um, second year in a row for my budget, we have had an over 3% increase in our um, health and human services providers um, that are growing that. And one of the great things about having a represented workforce at Multnomah County is that we make sure that we have cost of living increases um, every year for our for our county employees so that they also, um, you know, can can grow um, in their jobs and in their um, and in the work that they do, that we have to be continuing to value the work of workforce. I will say one of the opportunities that I think that we have this year is working with some of our private sector partners, um, our partners at the state, our partners in universities to figure out how we can um, continue to grow the number of people who want to get into some of our most critical fields. So having those types of programs um, um, is is going to be really critically important. And I think that's an area that's ripe for um, investment and partnership this year too. That's awesome. I love to hear that. Anything to help support um, that pathway yeah. to the county. I know a lot of our students at Portland State are really excited to work there. And often uh, the challenge is finding paid internships for our students. So that's, that's, I'm really happy that you're you're thinking about that. They should check out the college to county program. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, that is a way of bringing paid internships into our county at all levels of our organization. And we appreciate you coming to our campus and and sharing those those opportunities. So you were talking about your workforce equity strategic plan. Um, 
I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about county morale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you read a lot in the news about, you know, that folks are struggling and it makes sense. We're in this really difficult time. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Multnomah County, many people didn't know this before the pandemic, but Multnomah County is actually the government that was responsible for the pandemic response um, for Portland and for the rest of the cities in the entire county. That meant that our, um, not just our health department, which of course you would think public health would be a part of this, but every single part of our organization mobilized um, when the pandemic hit to, to pivot, to make sure that we were providing a response to our community that we needed. Um, we've seen massive um, impacts of that um, across our organization um, and people are still feeling that, right? We also, as a community, as a nation, as a globe, you know, we went through an incredibly traumatic event with a, with a global pandemic. And, um, and I don't think we've actually been able to deal with that in the ways that we need. Like those impacts of, of the last few years, I mean, we're gonna be feeling that for at least the next 10 years. Um, and I think recognize that and holding space for that is really important. I don't think we, we do that enough consciously or intentionally that we need to. And I will say for our for our county employees, that is that is a real thing because many of them were on the front lines. Many of them showed up every single day um, in situations where you know they felt that their health might be at risk. They we had people to show up um, to work in our in our jails, in our detention center, um, even during um, days of protest, right? We had um, folks who were um, on the front lines of so many of these things. And, and that has an impact. So mm -hmm. as we're, one of the things that I have shared with um, the leadership team as at Multnomah County is like, we have to be listening to our employees about what they need right now, what they need in this moment. Um, and, 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 you know, as we work with our representative employees, as we work with our different um, programs and services and, and um, partners, even in our work, um, you know, we need to be working in partnership with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I have an elderly mother, and uh, I know many of us have that experience of, you know, feeling that the sandwich mm -hmm. uh, um, dynamic that a lot of us are feeling. So I want to talk a little bit about our aging population. So according to the census in 2034, there will be more people 65 years or older than under the age of 18. And they're seeing this as a permanent demographic shift. Um, so Multnomah County, I understand, is part of the age-friendly network, so that's fantastic. How does aging and the longevity economy or contributions that this community um, gives to, our, um, to their community fit into your priorities? Uh, they are also one of the fastest growing unhoused populations, age 55 plus. So yeah, how do, how do elders fit into the Multnomah County? What is your vision for that? That is a that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of um, different pieces that that can go into my answer. I mean, I think one of the things like the demographic changes that are happening are very real, and we have to be um, thinking about that, considering it, and making space for that in all of the work that we do. Whether it's an infrastructure investment in how we're designing a street, whether it is in the type of housing that we're being built. Um, whether it is in making understanding that people who are um, experiencing homelessness um, possibly um, through aging or not being able to afford a rent increase or something like that, their um, what they need might look different than how we currently have our sh systems or shelters built, right? So it's being responsive and, and inclusive of that. One of the things that I think is really true, um, and I've heard many times, is that you know if you build something for those who have additional um, challenges like are an aging population, you're actually making um, that system, that community, that space more equitable and accessible for everyone. And so I think that's really um, going to be at the heart of, of what we do. Um, I also think like one of the things that I've loved about the, this work that I've been able to do um, both here at the county, but in my previous role as a state representative is, is the really um, good um, and strong relationship with many of our, um, our tribal nations and, and our folks in our indigenous communities. And, the, and, and we can learn a lot from the perspective of um, really respecting the wisdom of the elders and including, you know, and considering them uh, such a respected part of our community. And I think so, it's not just in how we build, but it's also in the learnings that we take from this population. Um, 
and really changing the way I think society at large might view it. It's not it's not a problem to be solved. It's actually, you know, an opportunity um, and a gift for us if we can use it the right way. I love it that you said that because I think my mom's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> my mom knows she's brilliant. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that we could all learn from our moms and our grandmothers. Absolutely. Especially around conservation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I know like my mom, um, uh, she has a saying, mejor que me, que me hace daño que se echa a perder, which means like I'd rather it uh, make me sick than for it to spoil this idea that the world is so precious and the things that we um, that we have around us are so precious and and they came at a cost. And so it's really important for us to respect that. So it's sweet. Thank you. Um, I do want to ask you about uh, about elections, you know, new form of government, changes to composition of the commission. Yeah. There is a lot going on there. But first, um, there have been several articles about uh, your power as Multnomah County chair. And uh, as yeah, I want you to talk a little bit about how do other commissions work? Do they work the same way in other cities and then or other counties? And then can you de detail your powers and what you believe is appropriate for your role? Yeah, I mean, so every every um, system of the government is set up slightly differently. Right. And um and we have, and I mean, we know like the city of Portland, for instance, is going through a huge transformation right now as they're switching from um, a smaller commission where the commissioners actually had administrative power over the different, um, you know, city bureaus to one where it is a um, going to have a city manager, a mayor, and then a an elected council that's really going to do a lot of the legislative and policy work. Um, uh, we have um, in Washington County, we have a county manager, um, an elected chair, and then an elected commission. And the chair um, really shares some of the legislative um, power with the with the um, uh, commission in addition to the work of the chair. In Multnomah County, the, um, the chair is elected countywide. It's the only position that's elected countywide. And it holds both um, the chair of the county commission, so the board, like the, the chairperson of the board, but also the, the CEO and running the administrative piece of the county. And I will say that um, those are like two full-time jobs. I mean, not really full. I mean, you know, but but really the the work of running the county itself is a full-time job. And then there is all, and then there is working with the board and really um, doing the really important legislative and policy work to set up that we're just getting into our budget, um, our public budget process right now, which is huge amount of works. Um, the the way that the county has been set up in terms of its its structure and the role of the seat, um, the chair of, as the CEO, um, as well as having that seat on the board, I think that's been the case since like the the 80s. So there there hasn't been anything that's really fundamentally changed. Um, I think it was like in 1984 where the chair was um, added as the as the chair on the board as well. So that really hasn't changed. It is a lot of power, and I think that's why it's um, really important to be working in partnership with our with our commission and to be making sure that we've um, you know that we have a vision that we can be working to together. But ultimately, the Multnomah County Chair does have the responsibility for um, for putting the plans, for putting the budget, for putting the policies that are passed into action. And that requires working closely with the COO, with all the different department directors and leaders to make sure that work gets done. And that, to me, is the kind of the biggest priority and the biggest responsibility of being the chair. That was really helpful for me. I guess I didn't realize that, that, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's like governing and managing. Yeah. And you're doing both of those things together. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was it would be like if Tina Kotek, when she was elected governor, also stayed as Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very it's a very kind of um, different type mm -hmm. of, of work when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you think that that's working? Yeah, I mean, I think it does. It has worked for for many, many um, years. I think that it's I mean, I think we can always look at different ways of doing things. One of the things that I did is um, in this last year is reach out to NACO, which is the National Association of County um, Officials. Uh, it's the national um, group. And just and and ask them about, like, what do different forms of county government look like? Because mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting to know, like, just because we do something here one way or we've been doing it for a long time, like, what does it look like? And there's 
such a variety of different ways of doing things. So I always think like, I think that's a very useful process to do. Um, but I think especially in this critical moment where we have so much big, important work that we have to get done, having the ability to, to push forward with that work with all of the organizational resources united is, is going to be a really key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I want to shift our attention over a little to youth. So what I did to prepare for today was I reached out to my network of folks um, and asked them, what what would they ask you? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do they want to know about? And for those of you who know me, I do a lot of work in the youth community. Um, and uh, a couple of youth reached out to me with questions specific to the climate crisis. They're very concerned about the climate crisis, and they see that you've done actions in the past and, and are currently working in that area. Tell us more about your vision in addressing the climate crisis. Yeah, you know, the county has different ways that we can we can participate when we talk about our climate crisis. Um, when I was at the state, you know, I was actually the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee in the in the House, and we were able to do some big, you know, kind of uh, far-reaching policies that had statewide impact, like um, getting coal out of our energy mix. Um, we raised the standards for the how many renewables, and, and then subsequent legislators um, went to 100% renewable energy by a certain date, right? So there's so there's that big scale work. I think the some of the critical work that we do at the county around climate is recognizing what impact climate change, what impact our changing environment, what impact things like um, additional severe weather, whether it's heat in the summer or more um, snow or intense storms in the in the winter, what it has on our community. What are the impacts for the people who are living in Multnomah County, right? We can be, we need to be taking the steps um, at the county that really recognize and respond to the impacts that people are facing. So, um, you know, we were able, and, and that looks like, you know, um, doing more coordination among our departments to share information when there is something like like a heat event, right? Or a or a um, or or a um, you know or a snowstorm. It looks like um, really pressing for um, and raising awareness about where in our community is most vulnerable to impacts of climate change. We know Lentz, we know Rockwood, and, and other areas in East Portland and East County are um, have some of the hottest areas, for instance, in our in our city. And that's research that the that the county really has pushed forward with. And it's holding those responsible for the impacts of climate change, for the for the creation of climate change, um, uh, holding them responsible for the impacts that we're seeing in our community, which is one of the reasons we moved forward with the lawsuits to sue big oil. Because, you know, when we are losing, um, you know, dozens and dozens of lives in our counties and, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lives, you know, in, for instance, in the entire um, Pacific Northwest, because of heat of change, like that, that not just costs us the lives of those people, but it costs us in real, um, in the work that we need to do to mitigate um, climate change. And it, uh, it costs us in the terms of the investments that we have to make. And so we want to hold those people accountable. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad. Personally, I'm glad you're doing that. So thank you so much for that work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, or ask you about the crisis response system. Um, and, you know, we're talking about uh, responding to crisis as it relates to weather and climate change and things of that nature. But we just are having a daily crisis every day here in Portland, it seems like. And, you know, a lot of folks are are wondering about how specifically coordinating services across the multiple offices, all of these folks that have so many different responsibilities in all these different ways. I mean, we already have this really interesting governmental structure in in the region, right? We have Metro, we have the county, and then we have the city, and each one does different things, but yet many of those things are overlapping. So it must be so confusing to a lot of people to understand how are we coordinating? How are we speaking to each other? And how are we ensuring that the services that the folks who need it the most are getting it? So can you talk a little bit about, you've um, mentioned partnerships, you've highlighted partnerships, talk a little bit, maybe share a particular story where you see that partnerships are being impactful or effective. Yeah, one thing I always say is, you know, when, when, someone in the public, someone in our community sees a problem happening, they don't care who's 
government is supposed to be responsible for taking care of it. They just want the problem to be solved. And so, and, and they're right, like that, they, the problem should be solved. We should be working together. So for me, I've taken that to heart in the work um, that we've been doing at the county, even just, you know, even starting with our own, own organization and having a one county approach, meaning we're not having the joint office working in a silo for their, with their work without working with our Department of Community Justice and our health department to really understand the impacts to the people that we're serving there. But it obviously and definitely goes beyond that when we're looking at how we at the county are working with the city, um, both the city of Portland, uh, Gresham, Troutdale, Wood Village, Fairview, right? How are we working with our partners to respond um, and work together about the needs across our entire county that we are all we all have responsibility for, right? So that is included investing in new positions within the county that are directly focused on on doing outreach and engagement and, and partnership with those elected bodies. It means a lot closer working relationship with our with our um, uh, Portland City Council um, partners and and the mayor's office. We have had for the first time since. Um, in, in several years, we have started doing joint city and county hearings um, as we're talking about our homelessness response system, as we're talking about the work that we want to be doing together as we're looking at how we address this issue. That has been something that has been incredibly important to me because we have to be um, we have to be moving forward in this work together. So um, the work that and I want to give a shout out to Chair Harrington. Um, as well as Chair Tootie Smith, like we have every other week meetings where we're talking about how we as three counties need to be working together or what our shared priorities are. And they, that has you know, ranged from homelessness response to our ambulance service response to you know, just how we're, how we're just approaching this work in partnership. So that's really a key, um, that is a really key important thing for me. So the, the relationships that, that we have, the work that we're doing, it has to be incredibly intentional in breaking down silos, both here at the county, but also, you know, among the work and partnership we're doing. So um, one of the things that, um, you know, because we have to be working together to be successful, right? And when we're talking about um, homelessness, when we're talking about our behavioral health system, when we're talking about our, our community safety system, right? All of those things, um, we have to be really working together from the federal government down to our down to our local government and with our partners um, to do that. And and I do want to say though, um, you didn't ask about this, but but the space that we have to um, we have to have space in that work in those conversations for the broader community, for our partners who we are um, who are who are contracted with us to do that work, to the organizations that aren't like currently part of our. Um, part of our um, systems um, to the to the community people who are who are leading work on their own and want to be part of the system we have to be leaving space for part for that kind of partnership as well we have a lot more questions and we have time for not only the questions that you all submitted today but also the ones that were submitted online and the ones that i solicited from my network but i do have a question here um that i had on my list um so i'll ask that and then i'll ask one final question um and it's about um animal uh services um how how is it going over there how I, you know <laughs> How do you redirect animal services and ensure we meet our national standards? I think a lot of people are really concerned about our animals and the audit last year didn't wasn't so great. So how's it going? Yeah, so I think it's actually going so much better now than it was a year and a few months ago when I started this. When I first started this job, like literally the first thing that we had to do was actually close down intake at animal services because they just had too many animals, things were not working well. Um, so we shut it down and I called for a, an incomplete um, overview of what is happening um, at animal services and basically consolidating all of the recommendations that they've had from the audit, from previous audit, from previous reports that were done and really um, moving that, um, moving all of that into a project to, to um, take all of those recommendations and, and, and do a check-in where is the work with this? What is in progress? What's what's not been happening and what needs to be happening? And so that is that was a huge um, process that took us through um, this past summer. And now and um, and 
at the same time, we were actually doing community engagement and reaching out to communities, um, members across the board, volunteers, former volunteers, um, to get their perspective too. And that, that became a work plan, which now Animal Services is actually delivering on. And I want to give a shout out to Margie Bradway, who is here, who is helping lead that work in our Department of Community Safety, as well as our other Animal Services folks. Um, you know, we have to stay accountable. So one of the things was, you know, we care about humans at Multnomah County. It is also our, um, we also care about our animals and it's our responsibility to, to, to care about those animals as well. And so um, in my last year's budget, we made, uh, I made, we as a board made significant investments in our animal services to make sure that they had the n right number of people in order to be able to perform the work that we uh, need to do. And in this year's budget, um, I have um, um, proposed a three new field service officers for those folks who go out into our community um, to respond to animals in crisis or respond to needs um, for animal services in our community. So those are the things that um, are, you know, we're building on. And ultimately, with all of this good work that's happening, with all of the very planful nature of many of the changes are happening, we also are limited by the facility that we have there. And so in the long term, we have to be looking at what is the best facility and environment for our animals um, that we're responsible for. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Jessica, what's your vision for the county? You know, I'm a futurist and I'm always asking that question. You know, 10 years from today, what story uh, or stories would you like people to tell about where we are today? Yeah, I, I really appreciate, I know you're a futurist. I have participated in some of your, um, some of the sessions that you've had on like really visioning what we want. I mean, part of it was some of the things I've talked about in my speech, but I really truly, like I, I do this work as an elected official. I do this work as a public servant because I believe we have to build a society where we don't need a safety net where that people have the resources that they need. They have the education, they have the health care, they have the housing, they have these fundamental um, peace components of life so that they can be successful on their own, so that they can find the job, find the, um, the, the, the you know, kind of meeting and purpose in their life. Um, because I think too, too often um, we, we accept... Um, we accept systems that do not value and recognize the contributions that everyone has to give. And so for me, like in 10 years from now, it really is a society that looks more, that that really is about in making those type of investments, that we're building systems that connect with people in the way that they need to help them um, get on a path to their own you know, self-fulfillment. So their own stability, their own health, their own ability to to make what they want and choose the path that they want in their life, right? I mean, and that that work, you know, starts with what we're doing here, right? We need to have a better functioning homelessness response system. We need to have a better connected behavioral health system. We need to have, um, we need to be working um, better together on on um, for, you know, um, for seniors, for veterans, for, for our families, for people with um, developmental delays and dis um, disabilities. We need to be doing all of that work today, but ultimately we need to be setting it up so people have those, um, the connections to their own independence and their their own ability to to make the choices that they want in their life. I think preschool for all, for instance, is a, is a huge part of that, right? In 10 years, we are going to have a universal preschool system that is going to make sure that our children have um, this investment that shows our community cares about them, our community believes in them, and our community needs them in 20 years um, when they're when they're out there. Um, you know, doing the good work that they need. That really resonates with me. I feel like it, it goes back to the the moment where you said, if we meet the needs of the most vulnerable, then we're meeting everybody's needs. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that. And I believe that that's true. I think it's called universal design. And, and I'm really passionate about that. So thank you. So this concludes our program. Uh, thank you, um, Jessica, for your leadership and thoughtful conversation. Thanks for City Club, for hosting, and for OMSI, um, for allowing us to use your space. And thank uh, uh, thanks to each of you for spending your morning with us. Um, you can re a view a recording of this forum and others at the City Club website. And I'm Cynthia, and I love this county so much, and I'm uh, really dedicated to the work that you all are doing. So thank you. Have a beautiful morning. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.